Let's get right into it. What are exhibits? Uh, exhibits can be anything. They're real evidence, they're demonstrative evidence, they're documentary evidence, okay? The foundational requirements for all types of exhibits is the same, okay? Why do we use exhibits? Because people have different learning styles, okay? You can get up there and talk all you want, uh, and it just doesn't connect for some people. That's why we use a PowerPoint, for instance because uh, some people need to see this stuff and not just hear it. And it's the same with jurors and it's the same with judges. Um, I guess I'll go back a couple of slides. I was gonna skip this, but um, there's a research, this is a study from 2008, and it shows that judges process information similar to jurors. So this debunks the myth that judges are not in fact human. They are in fact human. They process information just like jurors do, just like regular human beings do. It says approximately 80% of judges want lawyers to formulate evidence into more cohesive stories, and approximately 80% of judges want lawyers to simplify technical issues. Exhibits are good for both of those things. So don't think just because some of you do a lot of bench trials and not jury trials that you can forego exhibits and forego the persuasive aspects of your trial because you don't have a jury. It's just not true. Your judges, uh, with one or two exceptions, from, for those of you who don't see anybody from downtown, um, actually can be persuaded, okay? Just like a regular human. So um, don't give up on using exhibits. Exhibits have an independent power of their own, okay? Um, exhibits, if you're in a jury trial, for some of you that do jury trials in here, exhibits go into the jury room with the jury. So if you put an exhibit into evidence, and you're done with your case, closing argument is over, and the jurors have retired to the, uh, to the jury room to deliberate, they get to bring your exhibits with them. Think about how powerful, if you don't think that's powerful, think about a case, say a criminal case, where one side put in exhibits and the other side didn't. Then while those jurors are deliberating, they would have all of your evidence and nothing for the other side. It continues to argue, okay? so. Uh, that's the independent power that exhibits have in a jury trial. So let's talk about what is evidence, what can be exhibits. It says all relevant evidence is admissible. You guys all know what relevancy is defined as, right? Uh, anything that tends to prove or disprove a fact at issue. Okay, so it's a really hugely broad um, definition. Dependency note, I wanted to point this out. What is relevant, right? There is um, an exception for polygraphs, evidence code 351.1. I just wanted to point this out because this gets quoted a lot in dependency, and that code section does not refer to dependency, okay? This code section says that polygraphs are not admissible in criminal cases, okay? And there's a footnote that says it applies to delinquency as well. It does not mention dependency at all. So if you want to get a polygraph in, um, do you research your case law, but people think that it's, it's blocked by code, it's not, okay? That's in criminal cases. So we're gonna jump to evidence code 401. Proffered evidence. This is evidence that you are putting in, okay? The exhibit that you wanna offer into evidence is defined as any evidence which is dependent on a preliminary fact. That's foundation. All right, so proffered facts are facts that require foundation. That's when you hear objection, lack of foundation. That means that the preliminary fact that's required has not yet been established. So for instance, if you're talking about, and again, it could be any kind of evidence. If you're talking about testimony, and I ask Mary, um, what did the room look like on June 1st? I may first want to establish that she saw the room, or she was in the room. Okay, that's the preliminary fact. What did it look like is the proffered evidence. Okay, this, as I said, it applies to testimony and exhibits. Um, 140, evidence is defined as testimony, writings, material objects, and other things presented. Okay, so it can be anything, literally anything. Um, foundation in a nutshell is you proving to the court that my proffered evidence is what it purports to be. It is what I say it is. Okay, if it's a photograph, this is a photograph of the room judge. 
here's here's how you know. And then the foundation is, see, I told you it is what I said it is. That's the way to think of it. So uh, 403A says the proponent of the proffered evidence has the burden of produce, producing the evidence uh, of the preliminary fact. So if you're the one putting in the exhibit or offering the testimony, you have the burden to supply that preliminary fact as well. Okay? Um, here's the burden. All right, so you're saying, how much of that preliminary fact do I need? If Mary's going to testify what the room looked like, does she have to say she was in there? What's the time frame that she has to be in there? Do I have to prove that the lights were on? Do I have to prove, you know, how much do I need of that preliminary fact? That's when we talk about the burden, okay? The burden is super low, super low. Here's what it says in, in the statute. Um, that there is evidence sufficient to sustain a finding. That's the buzz language. Evidence sufficient to sustain a finding that it is what I say it is. Right? So it just has to be enough for you to believe me. It's the lowest, uh, it's, it's a very, very low burden. Okay? Um, I'll get into this a little bit more to give you an idea. This is where when you hear people talk about weight, okay? Um, you can have varying degrees of evidence sufficient to sustain a finding. I can prove that Mary was in the room. I can prove that Mary was in the room five minutes before the photo was taken and the lights were on and she has good vision. And um, I probably can't prove that her mental health is clear, but maybe I could do that. You know, those are all things that build upon each other and that's far more than just evidence to sustain a finding. Okay, so that would be adding weight. But if I just want to get it in, all I need is evidence to sustain a finding. Just saying that Mary was in the room is, is enough. One question would be enough in that instance. So, um, authentic, authenticating or identifying evidence. So we're in 1400. 1400 in, in California, so if you look at the federal rules when they talk about evidence and exhibits, they group them all together. In California, in our evidence code, for some reason, it separates out writings and documents. So it jumps from the, the, uh, the 800s to the, the 1400s, but it's all the same burden. It's all, they're all treated the same. They just separated writings out, okay? The federal rule, um, we have the exact same buzz language. To satisfy the requirement of authenticating or identifying an item of evidence, the proponent must produce evidence sufficient to support a finding. Same thing, California is sufficient to sustain a finding, right? It's the exact same standard in federal court or state court. Um, I already told you about admissibility versus weight. In order to get it admissed, just enough to sustain a finding that it is what it purports to be. When you want to add weight, you can add weight. That's also, by the way, um, when someone says objection, lack of foundation, what they're really saying is, you have not put in that preliminary fact sufficient to sustain a finding. They're saying you haven't met that minimum threshold. Okay, and a lot of lawyers, uh, I see county counsel do this a lot, um, a lot of lawyers get that confused with weight, okay? So what they're really saying is it's not all that strong, but in order to get it admitted, it doesn't have to be all that strong. You need that little minimum burden. Okay, a lot of times you'll hear them say, objection, lack of foundation, he didn't testify what time Mary was in the room. Well, I probably don't need that. We can add it if you like, um, but that goes towards weight, not admissibility. So, um, examples, how do we get evidence to sustain a finding? Well, there's a, a million different ways. The most common one is testimony of a witness with knowledge. So you just put somebody who knows on the stand and you ask them, is that what the room looked like? You know, was it sunny on May 1st? Whatever. You just need to establish that this person knows. And I've got testimony from someone who knows. Okay, it's a catch-all. 403B says subject to 702, the court may admit conditionally the proffered evidence. So let me break this down. 702 is the code section that says you need personal knowledge, if you're a witness, to testify about anything. Okay, I can't testify about what uh, Dan knows. I can only testify about what I know. That's 702. Okay? 
when 403B says, I can admit evidence conditionally, that means I'm telling the judge, Your Honor, here's my proffered evidence. I'd like you to accept it. I understand that I have not given you the foundational evidence yet, but I'm going to do that later. Okay? So this would come up, let's say, um, I'm trying to think of an example. If, uh, if, if you are crossing, let's say that the county goes first in their case in chief, they put a witness on who you weren't sure was going to get into a certain area, you have an exhibit that you're going to put on with your witness. But their witness is talking about it. Um, or even better, here's a cleaner example. Uh, I've got my witness up on the stand and I want to ask them about, you know, exhibit A, but I can't lay the foundation for exhibit A until my other witness testifies, but they're not available until tomorrow. Uh, but we have a lot of, we have a whole day of trial time set aside today, so I want to talk about exhibit A with this witness. So I tell the judge, Your Honor, I would like to admit conditionally under 403B, exhibit A. I will come back tomorrow with my other witness and offer the preliminary fact. But in order to, and we're just trying to save time. That's what this does. In order to save time, I want to put it in today. Otherwise, we're going to have to wait. I'm going to bring my other witness in tomorrow, put the preliminary fact in. We'll admit Exhibit A, and then I'm going to call this person back and talk about Exhibit A. Okay, so the code section does let you have things admitted provisionally. Now, there are jury instructions, if it's a jury trial, that say if you forget to go back and put that preliminary fact in, uh, the jury's to disregard whatever Exhibit A was, right? So don't forget. <laughs> don't cancel your second witness tomorrow. You still need that preliminary fact. So what is the procedure of getting an exhibit in? Okay, that, that was sort of the, the evidence lecture behind it. What's the procedure? The, the first thing you do is mark your exhibit. Most of you know that are in court a lot, you, you should pre-mark your exhibit so you don't piss the clerk off. Um, so you pre-mark your exhibit and you put that on the record. You can say, Your Honor, I'm marking uh, you know, plaintiff's exhibit one or I have what's been pre-marked for identification as plaintiff's exhibit one. Then you have to show it to opposing counsel. You also put that on the record. Your Honor, may the record reflect that I'm showing this to opposing counsel. They'll say yes. Then you have to approach. You need permission to approach a witness in trial. So again, you ask the judge, Your Honor, may I approach the witness? They'll say yes. And then you show it to the witness. But again, you have to put it on the record. All of these things are, are actions and movements that you're doing in court that aren't necessarily on the record. So you've got to verbalize all of the things that you're doing so that it gets on the record. So then you say, um, you know, Mr. Witness, I'm showing you what's been previously marked for identification as Exhibit A. Okay, so those are the four steps. You say them all on the record. I'm holding what's been marked. Uh, may the record reflect that I'm showing it to opposing counsel. Your Honor, may I approach? Madam Witness, I'm showing you what's been previously marked as Exhibit A for identification. Okay. Notice the, the terminology that I use. I say it's what's been marked as Exhibit A for identification because that's all it is. It's not Exhibit A yet. Okay. The court has to receive it into evidence for it to become Exhibit A. So for now, it's just what I'm labeling as Exhibit A. So you say, I'm holding what's been marked as Exhibit A, and, or what's been identified as Exhibit A, but it's not yet Exhibit A. Then the, these three questions will get uh, a proper foundation for probably 90% of the exhibits that you want to admit. All right, so once you have the procedure down pat, I have what's been marked, showing it to opposing counsel, may I approach, Madam Witness, here's Exhibit A. Once you have that down pat, you only need to ask, in the vast majority of cases, three questions of that witness to establish foundation. They are, do you recognize this? That establishes Evidence Code 702. That establishes personal knowledge. Yes, I recognize it. I have personal knowledge of this. Okay? Then you ask them, what is it? Okay, that goes to 401. It identifies our evidence. How do you know? That's 403, evidence sufficient to support a finding that it is what we say it is. 
That's the three questions. It's super simple. People overthink this all the time, okay? Do you recognize it? What is it? How do you know? Every now and then you'll need something extra. Let's say it's a photograph. Um, you may have to establish time, you know, the element of time when the photo was taken versus, but 90% of the time, that's enough, okay? Do you recognize it? What is it? How do you know? Once your, once your witness answers all of those questions, you know, like, uh, say this is a watch. Do you recognize it? Yes, this is my watch. How do you know? Well, I wear it every day. I got it uh, as an anniversary gift from my wife on our 10th anniversary. I would recognize it anywhere. So that's one, two, three. How do you know? So I've said enough. I do recognize it. I have personal, that means I have personal knowledge. I identified it. And how do I have that basis of knowledge? Well, because I wear it every day. That's it. That is evidence sufficient to support a finding that your proffered evidence is what it purports to be. Okay? Just learn those three questions. Don't get caught up. Don't add stuff in between. Boom, 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 you're done. Okay? Then you offer it up. Because just because your witness has identified it, has told you what it is, and has explained their basis of knowledge, it's still not in evidence. So you've got to ask the judge, Your Honor. I offer plaintiff's exhibit number one into evidence. Or may the court receive plaintiff's Plaintiffs one into evidence. Mothers, mothers exhibit one, dependency trade. Yes, they will accept it into evidence. Now, if counsel says objection, lack of foundation, you know if you've done those three questions that your foundation is tight, it's solid, and it's good. You don't need any more. Okay? Um, don't, don't let counsel trick your judge into thinking you need more, okay? Because now if you're adding more, you're going above that minimum threshold and you're adding weight, which is fine. You're gonna do that anyway in your direct exam, but you don't need it to get the evidence in. So you can offer up your witness on voir dire to opposing counsel, okay? Essentially, when opposing counsel voir dires are saying, I don't believe you, Mr. Witness. How do you really know? What is the basis of your knowledge or how do you recognize it? Or, you, or perhaps you've misidentified it. That's essentially what the opposing counsel is saying when they request voir dire. When it's your witness and your evidence and opposing counsel comes into voir dire, you want to make sure that their questions actually go to admissibility and not to weight. All right, so if we're talking about the example with Mary who's identifying a picture of the room um, and they ask her, what date did you see the room uh, is this what the room looked like on you know today or that day? Th those things all go to wait, and that's when you're going to jump in and you're going to say, Your Honor, objection, Im improper voir dire would be your objection. When you say these questions go to wait, not to admissibility. I've established, I have established admissibility already. Um, the court will determine if they rule against you. Of course, ask for argument. And you want to remind the judge, I just need evidence sufficient to sustain a finding that it is what I say it is. All this other fluff is weight. And once it's admitted, it belongs to the court. So make sure your clients know that. If they're giving you some evidence, right, it becomes part of the record. So if you have some document, they're, uh, I'm thinking dependency specific, their drug treatment uh, certificate, and, and they're super proud of that, you know, make a photocopy. All right, don't give the judge the original if your client wants the original. Photocopies are okay. Um, I think I have a slide on that coming up. So I did my watch. Um, does anybody want to be, who, who, who can volunteer? Who's up to volunteer? Mary. Mary? Somebody said Mary out loud, I, I didn't say anything. What do you need me to do? Lay a foundation, here. What do you have? What do you have? Boom. Am I laying the foundation or nope. are you? You're the witness. Kelly oh, is the lawyer. Me? Exhibit one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the record reflect, I'm showing opposing counsel what's been previously marked as exhibit A. 
it, the record will so reflect. Thank you, Your Honor. May I approach the witness? You may. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Ms. Livingston. How are you? I'm okay. Good. Uh, do you recognize this? Uh, yes, I do. May I ask you what it is? It is my personal cell phone. I may ask how you recognize this is your personal cell phone. It um, weighs a ton and it has a picture of all my five children on it as my screensaver. Thank you. I mean, just so you know, this is now becoming property of the court. <laughs> That's fine. Just return my children's phone messages. I'll make sure to do that, Ms. Livingston. So, last question for the judge. Uh, Your Honor, may this be entered into um, evidence as previously marked Exhibit A? Yes. All right, thank you. Identify it for the record. Uh, ask them, do they recognize it? What is it? How do you know? Okay. Um, very, very easy. Were there any objections to foundation? I have a question. Yes, question. Let's say your judge has slightly lost touch with her human side, and she, after all of this, does I not allow you to admit your evidence. How or what is the best way to make sure that the record is preserved with respect to whatever you were trying to prove? In so my experience, when this happens, your judge has now gotten confused between admissibility and weight. So I would then give the judge all the weight that they were looking for. So um, a lot of times, strategically, you'd like to put your exhibit in. I'm going to use this as an example. You put your exhibit in to evidence, okay, because now I'm going to ask my witness all about it. We're going to use it. We're going to describe it, explain it. We're going to get into it. But I want to get it into evidence first. That's usually the procedure for how we do this. You can reverse that. If your judge says, no, I don't think you've given me enough, and you say, Your Honor, I only have to give you this much, I don't have to give you this much, fine, get into all the questions with it not yet being admitted. Just the risk you run is that you forget to admit it at the end. So just make sure, hey, I'm fine, I'll give you everything I've got, you know, and go through every detail with your witness um, to establish as much weight as you can who your judge thinks is admissibility, but it's really weight. Um, and then at the end, say, after all of this, surely I've established foundation. Um, and you may want to talk about the basis of knowledge. So if, if, the, if the judge is fighting you when she asked Mary, um, how do you recognize it? And she says, it weighs a ton. You know, maybe the judge is thinking a lot of phones weigh a ton. I mean, you could ask her three more questions. Well, what else? What else and what else? She'll say it's got the gray thing, it's chipped, and you know it smells like spaghetti and what, whatever. Alcohol. You know, yeah, it smells like wine. <laughs> okay. Don't forget, after you get your exhibit entered into evidence, to use it, to have your witness use it, to have them wave it around, point at the diagram, show you the picture, whatever it is, uh, whatever the exhibit is. If it's a gun. Have somebody pointed at somebody. I mean, use use it. That's the power of the exhibit, right? A couple of your eyebrows went up when I did the gun thing. That's what you want to do. If you have your witness up there who's pointing their fingers, that's not as powerful to the jury as if the actual gun is being pointed, right? You want to use your real evidence. Don't forget to use it. Just because you got over the hurdle of getting it in. It's not over. Now is when you get into all the questions with your witness. Make sure you're making a record. Right. Okay. Um, you may also use it with other witnesses. Okay. You do not have to go through this process with each witness. Once it's in evidence, it's in evidence. Its reliability has been established. Okay. So you can now use it with every witness without going through any of that foundational stuff. All right, use it in your closing. Pick this stuff up. If it's real evidence, if it's a gun, pick it up, wave it around. All right, if it's a diagram, put it up. I know you guys don't have technology in your dependency courtrooms, but you could bring in a picture, right? Um, you can make sure the judge is looking at whatever it is while you're giving your argument. The example I used is a photo of a child's room. This is what I've been talking about. So um, in the picture, I think a couple of you have done my three-day trial skills training course. 
we have a fact pattern in that case file that we do over three days where the agency removed a child for physical abuse, head injury, and the defense is that the child fell off the top bunk and hit his head on a, a dresser on the way down. And the agency's doctor said, no, that injury could not have caused it. It must have been, um, you know, mom with the candlestick in the library. And so this is the photo of the room that we want to get into evidence. So, uh, volunteer. Yes. Ms. Middleman, was that you? Did I? I heard you just went to an evidence training, so. No. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Totally. So I'll tell you what, I will be, uh, you've, you've published it. We don't have a hard copy. We published it up top. I'll be your witness. Get this into evidence. I thought you said it's already in evidence. No, it's not. I want you to lay a oh. foundation. Oh. I, Who are um, you? I am this. I'm little Jimmy's dad. Okay. Little Jimmy, or, sorry. Uh, Your Honor, I'm showing opposing counsel what's previously been marked as Mother's Exhibit or father's exhibit A. Um, may I approach the witness? I don't know who the judge Dan. is. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Mr. Lemieux, I am showing you uh, what's been previously marked as father's exhibit A. Do you recognize that? Yes. What do you recognize it to be? Uh, this is a picture of my son, Little Jimmy's room. How are you familiar with Little Jimmy's room? It's in my house. Uh, I own Little Jimmy's room, and I go in there every day. I make his bed. I put him in bed. I wake him up. Uh, I, I'm in there. I'm in there all the time. Does this photo accurately depict what Jimmy's room looked like on November 1st, 2016? Okay. Is that necessary? No. No. That's the weight. That's weight. Okay. And it's not a bad question. I would probably ask it later. Now, this is also an area where your judge may say, no, I want to know. Because if it doesn't accurately depict on whatever date you say, June 1, maybe your judge is thinking it lacks foundation. But it doesn't, okay? Here's, here's how you demonstrate that one of them goes to admissibility and one of them goes to weight. If you ask me how do I know and I tell you I'm, it's mine, I own it, it's in my house, and then you ask me does this accurately depict what it looked like on June the 1st, okay? What if I said no? Well, if you're my witness, I would probably have gone over these questions with you. Right. But what if I said no? Is it now inadmissible? No. It's still admissible. Because you could say, no, it's not at all what it looked like on June 1. On June 1, this dresser was pushed all the way up against the bed. We didn't own the box of teddy bears on June 1. Uh, these two stools were up against the wall and the window was totally open. Okay? That's okay. Those things go to weight. You can still, we still get value out of this photo as an exhibit, even though it is not exactly as the room looked on June 1. Because you can differentiate in your head. You can say, okay, I can understand. This was over here, and these two things were over here. But I still, it's still valuable. You still can see how tall the bunk beds were. You can see how tall it is in relation to little Jimmy. Uh, all those things are still important, okay? And it still makes our exhibit valuable to our argument, to our case. It does not make it inadmissible. So that is a question you absolutely should ask and you should get into with your witness, but it's not required for foundation. Because even if the answer is no, we have an adequate foundation for this. And you tell the judge, Let's say somebody objects and says, it's not what it purports to be. And you say, I'm not saying it is. That's not where I'm going with this. Okay, I'm not trying to fool the judge into thinking that this is what it looked like on June 1. I'm going to ask him what date, what date did, what was this photo taken or whatever. Um, so I'm glad you asked that question because it, it illustrates the point. That one goes to wait. Okay. Does anybody else have a question they're dying to ask if you are Ms. Milman? Wow, this is the first time I've ever done this with a photo and nobody said, you have to establish you took the picture. Okay? What if I didn't take this picture? What if uh, your investigator took this picture? Is that anybody? 
Doesn't matter. No, it goes away. Doesn't matter. Okay. It doesn't matter. And that's a red herring with photographs all the time. Thank you so much. Um, that's a red herring with photographs. Very, very common red herring. People think you need to establish who took the photo. They think even worse that that's the person I have to have on the witness stand. It's not. You can send your investigator. I could take this picture. Okay, I could go there. Remember my cousin Vinny? His, his wife had the little lock click camera outside the sack of suds, and she's taking pictures. The guy with the big thick light, you guys remember my cousin Vinny? <laughs> Anyways, his fiance, Miss Mona Lisa Vito, took all the pictures they used to trial. That's perfectly fine. You don't need the, the guy who was shot in the sack of suds to take the photo. You just need to have him say, yeah, that's what it looked like. Right? So, um, same thing. We don't care who took the picture. If, if it matters to your case, you can ask. But it's not required for foundation. So, let's say the judge still keeps that picture out. You also establish it fairly and accurately represented everything on June 1st. You establish the father did take the picture. You establish all of that. And the judge still says, no, I'm not admitting it. Is there a way to make it part of the record so the appellate court can see it and know that it's not harmless error? Well, before I even get there, what I would tell when I would train young lawyers uh, when I used to do this, I would tell them if you're stuck on foundation, just ask. So I, I've done it myself. I'd say, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I think I, I've established um, that my witness had personal knowledge and established a baseline of whatever you're going to say. And you say, what element of foundation am I missing? And I think it's perfectly OK to ask that. In my personal experience, having done that a bunch of times, um, because frankly, I think judges screw this up a lot. The judge might say something ridiculous, like you didn't establish who took the picture. And if you want to fight with your judge that that's not foundation, you can. Or you can just say who took the picture. Um, but I would ask, the first thing I would do before I worry about laying a record for appeal is I would say, Your Honor, what's missing? I mean, I, I suppose your judge could say that's your job counsel, not mine. But most of them won't. Uh, I could think of one who would, but most of them won't. Uh, and, and it would be a refresher. I would, I would send them over to the 400s of the evidence code. Ask for a minute. You know, I, I don't have all these codes memorized normally. Uh, I have certain big ones memorized, but I'd say, can, can I get two minutes? Because I, I think I've laid foundation. I want to cite the code section to you. And you know, foundation's all the 400s. If it's a writing, it's 14. You just pull it out. 403 says evidence sufficient to sustain a finding that it is what I say it is. Everything else is way too much. And once you put that on the record, if your judge still says, no, I mean, there's no accounting for, for a bad judge, sometimes things just need to be appealed. But um, you are also allowed to make a record. Uh, I can't give you a code section. I don't know what it is. But if a piece of your evidence is, is denied, um, or if your exhibit is denied into evidence, you can make an argument. You don't have to worry about it. You're supposed to make it outside the, the, uh, outside the presence of the jury. But of course, in the pendency court, you don't have to worry about that. You say, Your Honor, I'd just like to make a record for appeal as to what this piece of evidence tended to show what its relevance was, or whatever. And the judge is supposed to let you make uh, put on the record a short blurb about why this was important, what what it was going to do for your case. So I would ask to do that if all else fails. You know, just so when, you know, when the uh, fourth DCA reviews this, Your Honor, I want them to know because I'm appealing your ass. <laughs> okay. Using statements to refresh and impeach. Um, Quick note on cross-exam. This is dependency specific. I stuck this in there for you guys. I try to squeeze this code section in whenever I'm doing uh, trainings for parents counsel. It's California Evidence Code 773B. It's a biggie. Um, I only harp on it all the time because it is so um, abused or misused or people don't know about it. Okay, judges get this wrong all the time. So if I make an objection, 
this is talking about cross-exam, the proper uh, objection is objection leading. Uh, if this particular scenario comes up, don't say objection leading, say objection 773B, then it makes your judge think. What it says is, cross-examination of a witness by any party whose interest is not adverse to that party. Okay, that's interesting language. It's not, their interest doesn't have to be the same, it just has to be not adverse. So, let's break it down so that it's simple for you guys. The cross-examine of a social worker by a minor's counsel whose interest is not adverse to county counsel is subject to the same rules that are applicable to direct exam. So that means if you have more than two parties in a case, if you have a parent's counsel, a minor's counsel, and a county counsel, and let's say county counsel puts a social worker up on direct, then the judge says uh, cross-exam, minor's counsel. Minor's counsel, if they are not, if their interest is not adverse to the party calling that witness, so in my example it would be the agency. If minor's counsel's position is not adverse, they may not use leading questions. So don't let them lead the social worker down the primrose path and say everything they want them to say. They have to use open-ended questions. Question. What about, um, so we're in a trial right now where the caregivers, the de facto parents are testifying. Minor's counsel's stated position is that she's in alignment with the de facto parents and wants them to keep the kids. Mm -hmm. And she was using leading questions and we objected based on that it was leading. Right. And so said, you said objection leading and your judge immediately thought it's cross-exam. Of course she can lead. Say objection 773B. Well, I said she's, they're aligned, and she uh -huh. said it doesn't matter. Right, it does. If you say, Your Honor, I'd refer you to 773B, it, it says if they're not adverse, she has to use rules that are applicable to direct examination. I mean, I have said this in a court trial, in a bench trial, arguing with the judge, and I said, please, May I quote you the code section? Um, if you make a big enough stink, even your judge should look at the code section. I mean, it's plain as day. There's no, uh, it's not ambiguous at all, right? So just because this comes up a lot in dependency, I always try to harp on it. It doesn't really have anything to do with refreshing or with uh, impeachment, but it's a big deal in dependency. So uh, don't let, it usually comes up with minors counsel leading a social worker, or the agency's pediatrician, or whatever. Don't let them use leading questions. The time when you get caught is when minor's counsel says, I don't know what my position is, or that nonsense, which when I do trainings for minor's counsel, I think that's a cop out. Um, you're a lawyer who has a client. If you go into a trial and you don't know what your point is yet, you're incompetent. Okay. Um, you need to do investigation just like all the other lawyers on the case and determine what where you're going just because you're a GAL doesn't make you a juror right so um, first of all I argue to the judge that's just blatant lie um, or she's admitting to us all that she's incompetent um, but the, the, the language that helps you here is it does not say they have to be aligned just, it's, it's phrased in the negative, so that helps us. They just have to be not adverse. So my point would be, I'm the one who said trial set. She didn't say trial set, so she's not adverse, right? Um, question. So that's a place as well. Right. If mom and dad are aligned, and you want to, you know, you're with Mary or whatever. I know some of you got to go to court. Don't sweat it. Um, if, if you and the other parents' counsel are aligned, or with yeah, the agency, or with the agency, you've got to use with their witnesses. You've got to use open-ended questions. Okay. Only if someone objects. <laughs> all right. So refreshing recollection. Uh, the main point is this happens all the time. Remain calm. People forget shit. It's okay. Um, the first thing you want to do is give the witness a minute. See if they can refresh themselves. 
All right, so we all know what we're talking about. This is you ask a, your, your own witness on direct exam. You ask them a question and they say, I don't remember. Okay, this, that's when refreshing recollection comes in. You are allowed to try to jog their memory. All right, so you ask them, are you sure? You don't remember? You need a minute? If it's a no-go, you can ask them what might help you remember. Okay, because let's say it's some little, you know, stupid detail, a date. You need the exact date for whatever reason. They go, I don't remember if it was Tuesday or Thursday. Um, you're allowed to ask them, what would help you remember that? Okay? And if they tell you, oh, I wrote it down, it's in my notes or whatever, you can use that. Okay, the basic method is you ask them, would those notes help you remember? They say yes. You're allowed to give it to them. They look at it. They put it down. A lot of times you hear lawyers say, ma'am, when you finish reading, will you turn it over? All right, because you don't want them reading from it. If they start reading from it, stop them. No, ma'am, hold on. You say, just read it. I'll let you know when I have another question. When they're done reading, say, are you all finished? Yes, flip it over. Okay. Did that refresh your recollection? All right. Now, that's the buzzword. That's the word you, 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 you learn in law school, refreshing recollection. Please don't talk like that in trial, okay? Don't talk like a lawyer in trial, especially if you're doing a jury trial, because um, people don't know what the hell you're talking about. You say, ma'am, did that help you remember? Yeah, it did. You, you ask your meth-addicted, you know, high school dropout mom client, did that refresh your recollection? She's going to look at you like you have two heads, right? So you say, did that help you remember? Yeah, help me remember. And if it's a jury trial, you want the jury to be able to figure out what the heck's going on, too. So give it back. What's your answer now? You can use anything to refresh their recollection, but there is a catch. If you remember, I think there was, there was a case I remember from law school that said you can refresh with a ham sandwich. Do you guys remember that? I don't know what... I don't know how a ham sandwich would refresh in recollection, but you can use anything you want to refresh. Here's the, here's the big note, why we don't want them reading. If they read from a document, their testimony is now hearsay. Okay, and this is a little, I mean, let's be honest, this is kind of bullshit, right? If we know they're just looking at it and they go, oh, I mean, were there, is their memory actually refreshed? Or are they going, okay, now I know what it is. They put it down, they say it was Tuesday, or it was Thursday, June 1st. Um, that's not hearsay. But if their eyes are looking at it and go, it's Thursday, June 1st, that's hearsay. Right? So magically, if they turn it over, their, their memory has been revived and it's not hearsay. So, evidence code 771. This is what I said, there's a catch. You can use anything to refresh recollection. Whatever you use to refresh your witness must be produced to the adverse party if they ask for it. Okay, so you don't have to do this automatically. It's if they ask. All right? They can then read the whole thing, use it, cross-examine your witness with it. They can even enter it into evidence if they can establish foundation. So um, I remember when I was a new dependency attorney, I got burnt with this with my investigator's notes, okay? Because I refreshed his recollection with his own notes. And the other side was like, I'd like to see those, please. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're work product, not, no, too bad. I use them to refresh his recollection. Now they're fair game. So my advice to you is never use your notes to refresh a witness's recollection. Um, because then the other side gets to look at your notes and if it's done to you, if you're on the receiving end of this and you notice, oh, that's, what is that they're using to refresh? Mm -hmm. I've been, I, don't, I never saw that document. Ask for it. Okay. 771, you have a right to see it. Now, um, this also goes to, there's a preemptive way to use this on the offense, okay? So what I've been talking about is, is basically defense. What is that document? That looks kind of cool. I never saw that. I'd like to read it. That's defense. You can use this on the offense too. 
You can ask witnesses. This works for depositions, civil people. You can ask witnesses, opposing witnesses, did you use anything? What, what documents did you review um, in preparation for your testimony today? And they might say none, but they might say, ah, oh, if it's a social worker, she might say, I reviewed the notes and logs, I looked at the social worker's report, and something else. If it's a civil case, they might say, who knows what they might say. You know, I reviewed this, this, and this. Um, you're entitled, there, there's one little catch. You have to ask them, did that refresh your recollection? But you ask it in a leading way, and you trap them. You say, well, that, that helped you remember some things, did it not? Yes. Okay. Now, I've established that you used it to refresh your recollection, and I'm entitled to it. So then, if you're in a depot, you turn to their lawyer and say, I want that document. Okay, and if they didn't bring it, that's fine, but they need to produce it to you. If you're in trial, and uh, I'm trying to think, I mean, a social worker is going to review things that you probably will have seen anyways, but let's say it's some other witness, and you just say, did you, did you review any documents in preparation for your testimony today? Yes, I reviewed document A. And did that document help you remember some of the details? Yes. I want document A. Okay. Okay, yeah, it happens a lot with therapists appearing telephonically. Okay. And they don't recall a date or they don't recall a rate that they gave the client and you can hear them going through things. Shuffling papers. So how do you address that? Um, you know, I would just advise them. I would say, ma'am, you're not allowed to read while you testify. I can hear papers moving. I need you to put all the papers down. I mean, you, you can't enforce it when it's on the phone because what if they're just being real quiet now? <laughs> I mean, you're kind of stuck when they're on the phone. Um, but I would just give that advice. I would get it on the record that there's a dispute going on about this person reading. And I would say, what document? If I heard papers, what document is that? Oh, it's my whatever, whatever. Okay, did that help you remember some things about the gap? Yeah. I want the document. Your Honor, I'm making a request under 771 for that document that she's flipping around, if it's something you don't already have. Writing, uh, okay, so um, when I'm not going to do a whole full blown on past recollection recorded, but I'll, I'll explain to you what it means when you are trying to refresh a witness and you say, Do you remember? No, I don't remember. And you go, Okay, would this help? Yeah. You give them the document, they read it over, and you go, now do you remember? And they go, no, I still don't remember. Okay, now you move into past recollection recorded. Okay, past recollection recorded is a failed refresher. It's when you then take the document. This happens in civil cases when you have the, uh, the custodian of records for Citibank who no matter how much crap they flip through, they're not going to know all the payment dates for, you know, the Smith's mortgage or whatever. Um, you're going to have to go through past recollection recorded, which just means you need to lay a foundation for the document. The document comes in in lieu of testimony, okay, but it is not an exhibit, so it will not go in the jury room because technically it's testimony. So there's a whole, we have drills that we do to try, try to trick people when we're going through refreshing, I'll be the witness and I'll say, ah, I still don't remember. And people go, oh crap, what now? That's past recollection recorded. Kind of a cheating way to think of it is um, if you know the foundation for a business record, okay, foundation for a business record will always, if, if you can establish the hearsay exception of a business record, you have established foundation. Okay, and it's the same thing with past recollection recorded. Uh, because past recollection recorded is now hearsay. All right, or pardon me, it's, this is an exception to hearsay, but if you can lay the foundation for a business record, it's the same foundation it'll cover. It's a pain in the butt. Now, impeaching is different. Impeaching is refreshing an adverse witness, okay? But we don't want to be nice. When you're refreshing, doesn't it sound nice? It's so refreshing. You've refreshed. It's nice. You're my witness. I want to help you. I want to help you remember these things. It's important. Impeachment is I'm pissed. Now you're a liar. Okay? So this is going after the other side's witness. Okay? The basics are 
When you're impeaching, you're essentially saying, that's not what you said before. You're changing something. And I don't like it, I'm gonna call you on it. Make sure it's a real inconsistency, that it's important to your case, it has to be a main issue, and that you can actually prove it, all right? Hearsay is not an issue in impeachment, okay? <coughs> if you want whatever that prior statement is to come in for its truth, you're gonna have to lay its own foundation. But it can come in to impeach somebody without hearsay, it's an exception to hearsay. So, you're establishing the credibility of a document, it's usually a document, basically it's a prior statement, and then using it to assist you with an adverse witness. There are three steps. You confirm what the witness just said, then you credit the prior statement, and then you confront the witness with that inconsistency. Okay, so the first part is confirming, that's easy. So the, the, the very uh, simplistic trial skills training fact pattern we use is the traffic accident. The witness just testified that the light was green. She saw when Adam went through the light, it was green. So you have to confirm That, wait, did you just say it was green? Because you know damn well, last time you asked, he said the light was red, okay? So you confirm this statement. Did you just say on direct that the light was green? Or if it's a report, did you say in that report that the light was green, okay? This does violate the rule about repeating direct exam. You're not allowed to just go through and repeat everything that happened on direct, but you are allowed to confirm in an impeachment. You need to let the judge or the jury know what's going on. We do this by being incredulous. When I teach this, we try to have an incredulity contest. Who could be the most flabbergasted and offended? That you, wait, did you just say the light was green? Okay, that's being incredulous. You wanna be like, holy shit. Wait, did you just, you just testified on direct with Mr. Attorney over there. You said the light was green. Okay, yeah, the light was green. Okay, somebody's changing their story. So you've confirmed. Because you don't want to go through a whole impeachment and have that and have it be a mistake. Okay? That's why you want to be incredulous. Did you just say the light was green? You know, sometimes you might do that. Did you just say, did you just I want to confirm you just said the light was green? They might go, no, 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 the light was red. Did I say green? I meant red. Then your impeachment's over, right? So confirm that they are indeed, in fact, changing their story. <clears throat> then we move on to the next C, credit. This is the most important part of an impeachment, okay? We ask questions that bolster the reliability of the prior inconsistent statement, okay? These things could be timing of that statement vis-a-vis -vis the event. So you said a year ago that the light was red, and that was five minutes after the accident, right? So knowledge, um, oath or formality. You want to go through all of this. Witness descriptions often given while the perpetrator is still unknown. Now they know it's mom, so they're changing their story. I'll give you an example of this. But this is what you need to realize, this bottom part. Super important. Impeachment is only as powerful as the prior statement is credible. So if you can't credit the hell out of the prior statement, you're going to have a lousy impeachment. So, for the civil people, it's this would come up much more than it will in dependency. Dependency, you do impeachment by omission more. I'll do that the next slide. But a regular impeachment, you have a prior statement. So let's say it's a deposition. The deposition, they said the light was red, okay? But here in tribes, you just said the light was green? Confirm. Now I'm gonna credit the prior statement, okay? That's the one that helps my case. So I'm gonna ask them about the deposition. Uh, when we do drills teaching trial skills, I'll tell people I need 20 questions on accreditation. Give me 20 questions, okay? And the way you do that, it would look something like this. You would say, do you remember giving a deposition in my office last year? Yes. Remember, this is all cross-exam, so all my questions are gonna be leading. You came to my, uh, let's do it, Sarah, you can be my witness. 
Remember giving a deposition in my office last year? Yes. You came into my office. Yes. There was a court reporter there. Yeah. We all sat down around a big conference room table. Yeah. Before we started, the, the court reporter stood up and asked you to stand. Do you remember that? Yes. She asked you to raise your right hand. Yeah. And you did raise your right hand. Yeah. And she administered an oath to you. Yes. And in that oath, you swore to tell the truth. Yes. The whole truth. Yes. And nothing but the truth. Yes. And then you sat down. Yes. And I asked you a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. And then uh, when the deposition was over, um, about two weeks later, you got a transcript of that deposition from your lawyer. Yeah. And on the last page, your lawyer had you sign something. Do you remember that? Yes. And that signature said that you have reviewed the deposition and everything was accurate. Do you remember that? Yes. Um, so, I don't know, what is that, 15 questions maybe? Okay, I'm crediting, I'm saying, you know, and, and you, went, you did swear to tell the truth, right? Yes. Because telling the truth is important. Yeah. And you know that this is going to be used in a court case, right? Yes. So it's important to tell the truth. Yeah. This is how you credit. Okay, a million questions. If you're going to do it with a social worker, um, Madam Social Worker, you write reports, right? Yeah. Well, you went to the Social Worker Training Academy, right? Sure did. And they talked to you. They taught you how to write reports. They did. It's a very important part of your job, right? Yep. You even have a centralized computer system at your office for keeping your notes in, right? We do. Um, and anyone can add things to that, right? Yes. Uh, that's probably a bad staff question. Percent. Yeah. Um, and then you review those notes when you write your reports, right? Yes, I do. And you know that those reports go to the judge. I do. You know the judge relies on those reports. I do. And that the judge is making just uh, the decisions that are uh, extremely important in the lives of these folks right here. They might say that. Okay, so that's how you credit it. So you just, you, you want to hammer it. No, you were telling the truth before and you're lying piece of shit now. Okay, so credit, 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 credit the old one. And you could do the same in dependency, like with a forensic um, interview, you know, from Chadwick with a kid on the stand when their statements are contradictory to what they said five months ago at Chadwick and they mm -hmm. promised to tell the truth then and... Yep, and you can say, and, and if you want to get into things like this that are, um, you know, that that was closer in time to when the mm -hmm. incident happened. You, you want to be careful when you go down that road though is you never want to ask them to agree with you. So like for instance, you say, that was closer in time to when you were molested, or mugged, or the car accident, or whatever. Yes? Yeah, that, that was closer in time than it is today. But you don't want to then ask the follow-up question, the one question too many. So you remembered better then than you do now. You know, just be careful. You just want to credit the prior statement. Um, so once you, if you ask 15 or 20 creditation questions, you're going to have a very powerful impeachment because we now know that you must have been telling the truth before. And Kev, what happens if you don't have a prior inconsistent statement, but you have an omission? Omit, yeah. Okay, I'll do that next. Um, so confront, some lawyers do the question and answer themselves. That's kind of weird. The way I do an impeachment um, is I will approach the witness and ask them to read along with me. So I just got done crediting your prior statement and you told the truth and all this and you signed in the deposition and the truth and you know all that and then I will walk up to the witness with my document okay and I don't want I want to keep control this is cross-examination this is my show it's my time to make my witness look stupid this witness looks stupid so don't give them any control <coughs> so you don't want to give them you don't want to ask them any question that will give them the opportunity to explain away this inconsistency. So I will walk up to them with the prior statement. Let's say it's a deposition transcript. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. And I'll say, Mr. Witness, uh, would you agree with me that right here on page 14, line 10, it says the light was red? Okay, I'm not asking, did you say the light was red? I'm, not, I'm only asking for you to confirm 
that that's what's on the piece of paper. And if he starts going, I say objection, non-responsive. Sir, I'm asking you to confirm what's written on the paper on line 10. And on line 10, isn't it true that it says the light was red? Yes. Then you're done. Then you walk away. You don't ask, so when, which time are you telling the truth? None of that stuff. You said the light, it says the light was red. Yes. I'm done. And you take a little dramatic pause, put the paper down, look at the jury. Might be a good time to end. No more questions. Don't ask them to explain which time they were telling the truth and which time they were lying. Don't give them an opportunity. Because the other side's going to get to redirect. They're going to try to explain, oh, no, 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 I, I said green back then. And you can say, look, you know, in your closing argument, she's a liar. You had a question. Is there a way to use this with like parents' statements in a report? It's really hard because now you got a secondhand statement. So it's really hard to credit a secondhand statement. Um, it's just, it's not going to be as powerful. Because I'll just say I never said that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not going to be as powerful. Now, what can be as powerful is. Um, Oh, here's me. So I gave you down the mechanics. This is this is like the inconsistent statement in a report. I went through some of this. You're trained. You know these reports go to the judge, blah, blah, blah. You signed it. That would have been a good one that I didn't ask you, Madam Social Worker. When you write these reports, you sign it at the bottom. You sign your name. You attest to it, right? And your supervisor does too. Um, so impeachment by omission. This is going to be more common for you guys. Uh, I think that I give you an example. Not yet. Um, so this would be, uh, you know, let's say the social worker testified um, just now on the stand that uh, two months ago I saw the mother hit the child in my presence. And you're going, what? That's not in any report. Like that's some important shit that if that had happened, that would have been in a report, right? So now you jump into impeachment mode. Okay, so you get the witness on the scene. You say, did, did you just testify that two months ago you saw the mother hit the child? Is that, that's your testimony today? Incredulous? They go, yeah. Okay. Well, now we've had two or three court reports entered since then. So now I'm going to attack her for that not being in the court report. And I'd go through the same stuff as I did with you the first time. You write court reports, don't you? Yes. You've been trained to do that. Yes. It's a very important part of your job. Yes. It takes up a lot of time. Yes. You have this note system. Yeah. And that's so that you don't forget stuff. It's always there. Yep. And you look at that and then you write your reports. Yeah. And it goes to the judge. Yeah. And it's very important. Yeah. And you sign your name. Yeah. And the judge relies on it. Yeah. Can you show me in the court report the part where it says mom hit the kid? You better be right. I, if she goes, yeah, it's in the addendum report, I'm going to go, you better be right. But if it's not in there, okay, in your closing, you get to talk about a social worker who's not being honest with the court. Right? Because let's be honest, if she saw, if she saw my client hit that kid two months ago, that would have been the first thing she wrote in a report. Right? Now, it's usually not that dramatic which is where you find yourself walking the line. Uh, I say when, when you're going to impeach, whether it's impeachment with a prior inconsistent statement or impeachment by omission, it better be something material, okay? I like to say if you're gonna impeach over petty shit, it makes you look petty. It doesn't really hurt the credibility of your witness, okay? Because people will screw up details, time, day of the week, whatever. Little stuff like that, you might wanna think twice about impeaching you might want to just clarify, sure it wasn't on Friday, not Saturday, or whatever. Um, but if it's material attack, that's like, that's your time. I apologize for going late. Uh, I was going to say uh, thank you very much. Parents, counsel, this doesn't go for you civil people. Um, but you, you dependency people, be proud of what you do every day. There's likely no population. Everyone else. There is, don't be proud. You two don't be proud of yourselves. Yeah. You money hungry civil lawyers. But you dependency lawyers, there's no population in the state of California that needs a lawyer more than a parent 
who's find themselves involved in the dependency system. So be proud of what you do every day. And remember, you can get rich doing dependency. Uh, that part's a joke. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, follow me. Here's on your thing. I got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. All my videos are on YouTube. I try to put up about two a week. Little short tips about trial skills. Um, they're super corny and weird. Uh, so go. I made one last week in front of the dumpster of my office. So go check it out. Please hit subscribe to YouTube and uh, um, let me know if you have questions. We'll do it off camera because this already went long. Thank you.